turn your Bibles, please, to Isaiah, the 55th chapter. In just a few moments, we'll be reading that passage of Scripture, which will serve as our lesson for this evening. I, too, am encouraged by the opportunity to be able to come on a Sunday evening and to worship with one another, with you. It's been a interesting time on Friday morning at 10, where Norris and I have recorded the Sunday night sermon on Friday morning. It's been an empty auditorium, uh, except for Norris, he fills it up pretty well, but there's just one person. But I don't think for the last six months I've heard us talk about discount one or discount two. That didn't happen on a Friday morning. I wish it did. It was nice to hear the soprano voices to do discount one, discount two, and to sing these songs and to be able to see your faces and to see the fact that you're interested in coming. It has been a great lesson for me that once we are not meeting at a certain time, sometimes it takes a little effort. We've got to be up there at Friday on Sunday evening at, you know, we've got to leave the house at a certain time. We've got to be there. Yes, we do. And if we're not careful, we'll think, you know, that's a little extra credit, isn't it? You know, we hadn't been coming on Sunday night. We've been getting all of our stuff online and we've been, we've been worshiping and on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, we just kind of got that off. And I think it's a little extra credit. No, it's not. But I tell you, it tells you when you don't do something for a while, it can be a bad habit. And I'm so glad that we're returning and on a Sunday evening to be able to worship and to hear another portion of God's Word. We need God's Word in our hearts, and therefore it could be in our, our lives. But you encourage me by here, being here, and this lesson, this lesson is designed to encourage us on something that is very important. Isaiah writes, Ho, get your attention. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, Come ye buy. Think about that for a moment. Don't have any money. Come ye buy. And eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear. Come to me, here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I've given him for a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander of the peoples. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and a nation that knew thee not shall run unto thee because of Jehovah thy God, for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. When we hear the word invitation, it can be an adjective or it can be a verb. We can be thinking, well, somebody invited me over to their house. And that's a nice gesture. So we've had a, an invitation. There's a verb, he's inviting me to their house. Or it may be that we see something that's very pleasant and it's very inviting. That's an adjective. I hope this worship service and every worship service is an inviting place for those who are seeking the truth of God. We must make it that way. It must be a people that are an inviting people. So we can invite and we can be inviting. I see both of those in this reading. This is an inviting place to be, to eat and to be filled with delight and to enjoy the fatness of what's provided. To be promised the sure mercies of David, that's inviting if I don't have a sure foundation in my life. It's Isaiah's great invitation but it is also him calling us to come to come and partake of this blessing that God has offered 
on the basis of the sure mercies or the sure blessings of David. So what I want us to do, I want us to see the type of people that are invited. I want us to see what is promised. And I want us to look at the end of the basis of that promise, but see if there's somebody else calling for you to come. Let's start with the beginning. When we think about how important this particular invitation is, Isaiah prophesied some 700 years before Christ came. And Peter says that the prophets prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They searched and they would prophesy, they would speak things that we've just read. They didn't know exactly how it would unfold. But they spoke of grace. It was inviting. It was a, a wonderful invitation. Isaiah did not know exactly how that would be carried out. But he prophesied the truth. And what we see as we stand on this side, we see how it unfolds, how it comes true. That ought to be exhilarating to us. That ought to be encouraging to us to realize we stand here and we bridge a gap of 700 years and build for eternity. The foundation is sure for eternity. And we just bridge time and we're able to look at it in just one sermon. When we think about who is invited, it is everyone who is thirsty and you can't pay. What a terrible predicament to be in. There's no water around, and you may be offered water in a bottle, but you're going to have to pay for it. I don't have any money. I'm thirsty, and I'm not the person on the commercial that the water's been dropped, and I need a little coloring in my water before I drink it. I am in Death Valley. I don't have any water. I am frustrated. I have no hope, and I am at the dead end. Isaiah calls and invites that person to come. I believe he talks about another person because this person has money. The first person doesn't, who comprises everyone. He also invites everyone who is, let's say, self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. They've got money and they've got energy and they're laboring and they're working and they're looking at this and they're looking at that. They're not frustrated at the end of the rope, it's at the end, and they have no more hope. No. They use their money. They've got the strength. They're dreaming this. They're searching for that. Yet, they are not satisfied. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? You're not being satisfied with what you think is bread. And it's not providing you satisfaction. You labor for that which satisfieth not. You're invited as well. Hearken unto me. And I think of those two classes of people. I run into them in life, don't you? You may be here at the end of your rope thinking there's no more hope for you, you are, you, but you're thirsty. You want something, but you have nothing left in your tank. You have nothing left in you to pay for it. The good news is that you don't need any money. The invitation is for you that doesn't have it. But it's also for you dreamers. They're going here, going there, getting that religion, looking over here, and you're not finding it. And it may be you're searching things in the world to give you satisfaction. Maybe a new car. Maybe a new hairdo. Maybe a new house. Maybe a new job. Nothing seems to bring forth the satisfaction that you long for. The invitation that Isaiah gives in prophecy is for that person as well. That's who is invited. What are they offered? What are they offered? Water. Notice verse 1. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. There's plenty of it. You don't have any money, come and buy. 
But there's the water. What does water denote? Because we're going to see water, milk, and wine. I wonder what they mean. They're not literally water, milk, and wine. They designate the blessings that when you come to me and the invitation that Isaiah is offering, the idea of you're coming to God, the Spirit is speaking through him. What do we need with water? What is our situation? I'm dead. I'm thirsty. I don't have anywhere to turn. I need to have refreshment. I need to have my life restored in me. Give me some water to drink. Come on, come and drink of the waters that are provided you. That's inviting, and I hear the verb invitation, inviting you. And there's the, it's, it's inviting, it's an adjective. That's good news. When you're dry and the world has not satisfied you, your own philosophy hasn't satisfied you, your way of life hasn't satisfied you, Listen to Isaiah's invitation. Buy of me and you'll have your money, but you also buy wine and milk. Let's talk about the milk first. Most societies, when you get grown up, you don't drink milk anymore. Americans, we, we drink it. I don't know what that says about us. But most of the time, it's for the babies. What do babies need? They need milk. There needs to be the nourishment. Their bodies are growing. They need to have strong bones. They need to have the milk that allows them to grow. Water gives you the ability to live life. You die without water. And thirstiness is just telling your body what I need. I give, come get the water. But I also provide milk for you. And when we heed this invitation... There's not only life, but there's also nourishment that we find in heeding the call of God. But then what does wine mean? It doesn't have to be drunkenness, and it doesn't have to be the type of thing that makes you drunk and gets out of your mind and that type of joy and excitement. But it is exciting. Milk is the... Is that nourishment to help us to grow the water? Is the refreshment? Is the needed of life? But wine, there's connected with happiness and cheerfulness. Listen to it in the context of godliness in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter and verse seven, that of how we ought to look at life and how we ought to live under the sun. And he says this, go thy way, Eat thy bread with joy. Drink thy wine with a merry heart. That's not getting drunk and out of it. I mean, last night, about 1.30 in the morning, I looked over the fence and a guy was saying, hey, you got any more tequila? As he's talking to his wife. Were they going to shut down at two? All bars do. Our neighborhood does it. And the music is loud. I'm not talking about that wine. I'm not talking about that exhilaration. I'm not talking about being out of your mind and the idea of being drunken. There is wine that is a joy. And, it, and the whole point here is that he's already accepted your works. You grew the vineyard. You squeezed the juice, the grape juice out of the wine. You ate the bread because you planted the barley. You planted the wheat. God has accepted your works. Enjoy the fruits of your labor as we talked about this morning. Let thy garments be always with white. Let not thy head like oil live joyfully with a wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of vanity, which is given thee under the sun. For this is thy portion in life, and the labor wherein thou laborest under the sun. Enjoy the wine, the fruit of your labor. And there was cheerfulness in the Bible with wine. I think something like that is missing among God's people sometimes. And this call, this invitation reminds me that these are the blessings. When we heed the invitation that Isaiah is prophesying about, when we heed that, there is life, there is nourishment, and there is joy. 
that is not out of our head and I'm just liberated. I, I, you know, I'm just a happy guy. No, there's a basis for that. It's knowledge. And that's what is offered. And what is so impressive, it's all yours without money. It is all yours without you paying for it. It is a blessing when you heed the invitation of Isaiah. But there was a price paid so you can enjoy those blessings. Just two chapters over in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the great chapter that pointed to Jesus and all aspects of his life upon this earth, his miracles, his rejection, his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection. What price did he pay? Verse 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Does our peace demand something? Yes, the chastisement, the punishment of our peace was upon him. To have peace with God again, the chastisement was on him. He paid the penalty, wounded, bruised, chastisement. And here's the great thing. With his stripes, we are healed. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 20, 4 and 25, he speaks about this being, being fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. That indeed, we had been led astray. And he brought us back, and he bore his sins in the body. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24 and 25. By his stripes we are healed, forgiven of our sins. We have peace with God again, reconciliation. But who paid that price? It wasn't money handed down from your vain manner of life, but it was precious blood, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Precious blood, as of a lamb, without blemish, without spot, so you don't miss it, even the blood, even the blood of Jesus Christ. And what Isaiah was talking about, and he speaks about the basis of our life and growth and enjoyment, the reason you have it is because the price was paid and you don't have to pay for it. That's an inviting call. When you're thirsty and have no money and you're broke and you're broken. It is an interesting call and one that I want to put on my little thing to look into deep, deeply. When I've been using my money, my energy, and I'm still not satisfied. The world won't satisfy you. You'll be wanting more, having more, and having more anguish and frustration in your life. But this is the spiritual call, and the price has been paid. Don't think it was free. I'm sure you probably have done this, but I've been in a group of, of men where the policemen were there and got money together and paid for their lunch. We didn't want them to know who did it. But when they walked away, they didn't pay for anything, but they enjoyed the blessings of that lunch. The price was paid. And Jesus paid that price. Life and growth and happiness. And you don't pay for it. What do you do with it? Eat it. Partake of it. And he's, he sets forth two things that are show the quality of it and the quantity. Eat it, partake of it, for it's good. It is good, we see in verse 2. And also that when you do so, there's fatness connected with that. Eat that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Fatness may not be a positive word to you in your diets. But fatness is a wonderful thing in Scripture. 
And if we look at it from the standpoint of Scripture, we say it's abundance. It's abundance. Yeah, it is. It's abundance. And that means it's never going to run out. These blessings, come take the water, come take the milk, come take the wine. And let that bring joy and growth, happiness and life to your soul. It's good, eat it. And you just keep on feeding on those things because there's always going to be plenty. It's called fatness. In Psalm 65 and verse 11, just one verse that I think makes this very clear. It is, it is the imagery of God, and he's nourishing the earth with his rain. It's as if he's now driving with a chariot full of things. And when he goes along the pathway, <coughs> it's just dripping over with things that are good. And the psalmist says this way in verse 10. Thou waterest its furrows abundantly. Thou settest the ridges thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessing and springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness. And thy paths drop fatness. Now if your imagery is there, that yellow stuff fat, and, and, and it just drops fatness, that's not, that's not pretty to you. But when you realize there's so much abundance of water, so much abundance of wine, so much abundance of milk in our imagery, so much abundance of the good things of God. It never runs out. Delight in it. Delight in it. It ought to bring so much joy to our lives to realize that that's what's so inviting about this invitation. Well, there's something else he wants them to do. He says, incline yourself. Hear. Come to me. Verse 3, incline your ear and come unto me and hear, and your soul shall do what? It shall live. Why? Because you're going to get to drink water, you thirsty soul. And he says, I will do something for you. Now, before we look at what he says there, do you see somebody inclined that's bored? I preached a funeral yesterday morning, and of course people had their mask. Some of the people I did not know, some of them I did. There was a man standing away in the back. It was in an open field, a cemetery, and there were trees. But as I preached to the crowd, there was one man with a mask. And he's leaning in because he was interested. He was inclining. Body language says a lot about you. And he had such an interest and his eyes on, over his mask, his eyes. I said, this man is listening to the word of God. And I said, that should be our interest. That's the invitation. Incline. Lean in. I got something great to tell you. I got something great to offer you. You don't have any money? That's okay. You've been spending your money recklessly? That's okay. I got something that is so wonderful. Incline your body. Listen to me. Then come to me. Because this is inviting. And you will be able to delight yourself in the blessings of salvation. In John, the sixth chapter, in, verses, in verse 35, this is how Jesus, I think, fulfills this real well. Come to me. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger. He that believeth on me shall never hunger thirst. Never thirst. I'll quench your thirst. You'll never run out of living water. That's Jesus. And Isaiah was looking to him. How do you know that? It's because the next verse. Because <laughs> he says, I've got one more thing to offer you in this invitation. 
Behold, I have verse latter part of verse three, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. There's the one he's inviting. God didn't have any money. He's at his wit's head. He's frustrated. The other fellow is just wasting his life. What he's searching for. He says, it's you. And even you, you'll have the sure mercies of David. You'll have the sure mercies of David. What was that? What was so sure to David? Oh, I'll be with you when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's sure mercies. But there was a particular promise that God made David at the end of his life when he's a going to, the kingdom's going to turn over to Solomon, even looking past Solomon. He said, at the fruit of your seed, your seed, the fruit of your, of yourself, the, the lineage of you, will be sitting on your throne. And it will be an everlasting throne. See where I get the idea of permanence, stability, that which will never end. And David was promised that. We see an, an angel speaking to a virgin who's with child. In Luke, the first chapter, in verse 31 through 33, and we observe what this angel said to her on this particular occasion. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. The babe in the womb is Jesus. And what promises came to David? That one would sit upon his throne that came from his lineage. The flesh he did descend, but he was the incarnate Son of God. And he's the one that Isaiah 55 says, I've given him for a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander of the peoples. That's Jesus. Sure mercies of David will be filled in Jesus, and what's his kingdom like? It will never end. And he says, that promise is to you. I'm inviting you to enjoy the blessings of that promise. What an invitation. What an invitation. And to realize that I want something stable. What about something stable for eternity? Come to me and you'll never hunger. Come to me, you'll never thirst. Heed the call of the gospel. Isaiah, 700 years before Christ came, is given that invitation. And Jesus is indeed fulfilling it. But the last thing is, is who also is inviting? Who also is involved in making this invitation? The Spirit, God, Isaiah is. We understand that. But he adds this. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And a nation that knew thee, not thee, shall run unto thee because of Jehovah thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. So whoever he makes this promise to, there's someone included there that they're going to be calling a nation that they don't know. And there's a nation out there that doesn't know you. But God has glorified you, and they're running to you because of Jehovah their God and the Holy One, because He set His glory upon you. And we ask, who is that? Who's also involved doing this invitation? They run to you because of Jehovah. He's glorified you. I think it's God's spiritual people. In Romans 9, 25 through 26, there was a people that among the Jews and the Gentiles, it wasn't just Jews, it wasn't just Gentiles, 
but it was centered in Jesus Christ. And Hosea, the first chapter and verse 10, was fulfilled in Christ as well. And he says, and he said also in Hosea, I will, call that, I will call that my people which were not my people, and her beloved that was not, my belo that was not beloved. It shall be in the place where I said unto them, you are not my people, they should be called sons of the living God. God has put his glory upon this spiritual nation. God's spiritual people who comprise the church, that spiritual kingdom. And the point is, is that God has put his glory upon them. They're not just Jews. They're not just Gentiles. They're Christians. And at one time, they weren't the people of God. We we're separated from God. They're not my people. Now are they the people of God? I think that's who's doing some inviting here. And we live in a time where the message of the gospel that we're doing here in this congregation, over the internet, and Brother Norris is making that possible with his expertise, is going worldwide to people we don't even know. And they don't know us. They're coming to the message that we can offer because we have the gospel. And we are inviting them to listen to it. That should be an exciting thing for us at this congregation. We should be exhilarated over that. Because local churches, small churches, how can we ever do that? We can do that with your help. A little money, we can do that. But see, what are we doing in this locality? You ought to be excited about that. You ought to be looking for opportunities in which you can invite people as you see them frustrated with the world. And maybe they're at their rope's end. They don't have anywhere else to go. And we can offer them that invitation. Because I do believe the bride is making this invitation as well. Listen to Revelation twenty two seventeen, And I'll apply every bit of this verse to Isaiah 55. It's the end of our Bibles. The Spirit, oh yeah, Isaiah made this invitation. The Spirit and the Bride. God's spiritual people who are following the leadership of the commander, Jesus Christ, who God has made him a witness to all the peoples. We understand that, and we're following him. The brides say what? Come. Come. Let him who hears say come. That's us. That's you and me. We hear the gospel. We've heard that invitation. We have we've come to Jesus, and we're excited about it. And we say, come, we're doing the inviting. And let him who thirst, that's who we've been talking to, let him come. It's for everybody. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life when you don't have any money to pay for it. Let him take the water of life freely. That's Isaiah's call. Fulfilled in Christ, echoed at the end of inspired revelation. And you can't get excited about shrinking time of 750 years into when it was fulfilled and building on a foundation for eternity? That doesn't excite you? Oh, when we listen to the invitation of Isaiah... I hope it does excite you because we have an opportunity in the days that we have left on earth to say come for the blessings that God offers you. He offers you water so that you can be refreshing in life so you can live. He offers you milk so you can build your spiritual life and grow. He offers you wine so you can enjoy the cheerfulness and be happy 
because you are a Christian. All I ask is that, are you a thirsty, desperate soul? If you are this evening, will you not heed his invitation? Will you incline and listen and hear what God is inviting you to do? Or maybe you're not that person, you're still searching and you're not satisfied. Maybe you're going the way of the world we talked about. If that's the case, Isaiah says, come. Jesus says, Let's come. The bride, the church says, come. But I don't have any money. The price has been paid. I've got money, but I'm spending it the wrong way. You're not going to buy it with money anyway. Come, you need the blessings of salvation. And would you like to have a sure foundation to build your eternity upon? Sure mercies of David, the promise given to him, and we see it fulfilled in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus will never die again. He'll never release his kingdom until at the end when he turns it back to God so God may be all in all. It is a great invitation. And I ask you to heed it. When the gospel is preached in Acts the second chapter. One of the things fulfilled in Acts the first chapter is that Jesus indeed was sitting on that throne of David. And when David used it from another standpoint of Psalm 16 that Jesus' body was not left in the grave and his soul was not left in the Hades, in the Hadean world. But he was raised. It fulfilled 2 Samuel 7, 12. Because he received the kingdom that was promised unto him. It was because of his resurrection from the dead. When people heard that message, they said, what, what should we do? He's the one that died for us and we put him there. We put him on that cross. What could I do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. And you'll receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the promise of the Spirit that eternal life. See, eternal life is the consequence of having your sins removed. And that's what he promises you. And Peter exhorted them, save yourself. He's inviting you to an invitation. We're inviting you to an invitation. The Spirit, Isaiah, and the bride, the church, said, come. You thirsty? Take the water of life freely and enjoy it. If we can help you in any way to make yourself right with God, come as we stand and sing.